to welcome Alison Hutchcraft. Alison Hutchcraft is the author of Swale, which was named the 2019 Editor's Choice by New Issues Poetry and Prose. One sec. And published in November, 2020. Her poems have appeared in Boulevard, The Cincinnati Review, Crazy Horse, Gettysburg Review, Kenyon Review, The Missouri Review, and The Southern Review. A former resident at the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology on the Oregon coast, she has been awarded a fellowship from the North Carolina Arts Council, a regional artist project grant from the Arts and Science Council for the city of Charlotte, and scholarships from Tin House Writers Workshop, Key West Literary Seminars, and the Community of Writers. She <laughs> teaches creative writing at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. We hope that you will take this opportunity to buy her book um, online at New Issues Press. There's a 30% discount on Swale, good till April 12th. So if you haven't already purchased it, please do so now. Paisley Rickdell says about Allison's book, swales direct and slow the flow of rainwater. And this collection directs the reader's attention to the ways that the natural world has indelibly shaped our human consciousness. And in turn, the ways we have attempted to trap and tame the natural. In these poems, manatees turn into mermaids through sailors lore priests weather Orinoco rainforests in the hopes of colonizing its inhabitants and foals legs are taped to facilitate their breaking. The animals we love most, we put in cages, Hutchcraft writes, and yet everywhere, the natural finally evades our capture. Hutchcraft examines the delicate balance between rapture and ravishment in poems as ambitious as they are beautiful. Please help me welcome Alison Hutchcraft. Thank you, um, Jennifer, for your generosity, um, your kindness and your brilliance in bringing us um, together here. And I am delighted and thrilled to be here and absolutely honored um, to be reading with Brian and Tommy who are brilliant, um, whom I admire very much. Um, uh, th this first poem um, is titled Calenture, which is um, the name for a kind of mind-body sickness that would afflict sailors long at sea. Um, sailors with calenture would begin to hallucinate the open ocean as a field and become obsessed with this vision and want to throw themselves into it. So this is Calenture. I shouldn't like to think of them, but I do. The men who spent their days as sailors, pacing the decks of their ships, who sometimes would get a certain kind of sickness that made the sea a field. How much the mind wants land after so much stretch of water, wants the most landish thing, a field thick with witchgrass or blonding wheat, a meadow silent, but for the ticking of insects. It must have felt like bliss, that first sight of the field so wide, like a yawn that never closes. Some say ships carried tufts of earth on board to bathe those afflicted, or when they finally reached shore, pressed the sailors' faces down into the dirt. From Calentura, Spanish for fever, those affected had a fierce look. I know I shouldn't like to think of those men, but what it must have felt like the field green and glinting in that sun. The few seconds in the air before they drop 
into those reedy waves, the unshorn grasses, their bare, unsinkable sway. This poem um, takes its title from um, something that Darwin wrote to his sister in a letter. Um, he was anticipating a trip to the tropics and it put him into a kind of heightened, strange, disembodied state. I have written myself into a tropical glow. The sea is laced in phosphorescence little galaxies afloat in the swell. Insects click their invisible tongues to wake the silken light. Volcano fire and lizard belly, dusky skies softening, bats unfolding, descending as the barometer drops, stars pinned to their velvety seats. And the air scented swallowed, insects falling into the open mouths of waxy orchid blossoms, spiny bromeliads, water pooling into sticky pitcher plants, tendrils curling, frogs bleeding their morning songs, the bleat that rises, billowing, filling the air like a flag or swelling like a sail. To not think of myself even for an hour, but of fireflies lighting the understory and everything tinged with this tropical glow, haloed, hallowed, steeped in bird song, the palm fronds pressing against the sky as if this world were glass and breath alone could make it flame. This next poem looks to um, another scientist, um, a naturalist, George Willem Steller, um, but it also looks to a kind of excavation. At some point in the, um, in the labyrinth of trying to write these poems, I realized there were many excavations um, and that um, this is one of the naturalist George Willem Steller performing an autopsy on a sea cow, um, which is now an extinct animal, um, one that he first studied um, when shipwrecked um, in Bering Island. Um, and this sea cow went extinct just about 30 years after Stellar encountered it. So this is Stellar and the sea cow. To be thorough, a naturalist must sometimes kill. Piling up birds, toads, fire-striped salamanders to procure the best specimen. Shipwrecked, Stellar too was meticulous, climbing the carcass of the sea cow, which they had dragged onto the beach by a hook, their knives tearing the fleshless when the cow at last stopped thrashing. It was hard work, perhaps not worth the tobacco he promised the men for their labor. Afterwards, they returned to their true tasks, months still left to reconstruct the ship and the naturalist to his, measuring the animal from tip to tail before opening her side to excavate the organs. Finally, Stellar was alone enough to note the thick ridged cutis and lice-like parasites feasting in the folds. It was a topography he could cut into. Tawny, black, he thought, like the skin of a smoked ham the cuticle bristling with small raised cups and deeper, tiny perforated holes like those of a thimble. The kind of hide when hung up to dry, you could strip like bark from a tree. 
where to begin. Snout, lips villous and rough as a hairbrush that would not soften when boiled. The tongue dumb at the mouth of the throat. Nothing proved too large, small, or crude. Not the stomach once stuffed with seaweed in which multiple men could lie. Nor ulna, radius, fork tail, nipples wide with lactation, the delicate urethra emptying. And when he dissected the head, how carefully he sliced skin from the eye to see the sticky lacrimal sack, large enough to hold a chestnut. It took every effort, mounting again and again the height of the abdomen, plunging the knife deep into recesses between bones, into subcutaneous fat. When punctured, the plush mammary glands released what was left of their milk, and Stellar found that it was sweet, yellow, the color of light through sheer curtains to which he woke as a boy. Imagine Stellar, flush with his work, ignoring the stench of dead sailors, half buried in the sand and scavenged by foxes, as he stares out to the sea, to the rocky cliffs studded with mammoth bones, to the sea cows still alive and feeding, the seals curling under the waves, the fog lifting into what the future will be. Swale. In my winter by the sea, I fashioned a new habit. Each day walking to Crowley Creek through mud and leafless alder, their branches cupped by the plush green of mosses and rolling beds of sword fern, whose serrated edges thrust extravagantly into cold and humid air. The creek fed the estuary, which in turn fed the sea. And I like to see how far up the tide had reached or how far it had receded the marshy banks transformed by that lunar clockwork on which my hours turned. Water called slack, like the grip on a rope loosened, at which point the river would swell and still, the brackish tide having expanded the limits of the creek, submerged grasses swaying like the drowned hair of a doll. Cold and hard and clear, the water looked like the creek I felt in me. Day after day, I watched gulls float like wooden toys, rocking on the unsteady surface, and studied barnacles clasped to rocks, the shell-white skeletons of small shoreline animals, discarded limbs of driftwood. Swale also meaning a depression, a low place in the land. The sour smell once the water has drawn back, unmasking river sludge and battered sea debris, luminous blue valella with their fan-like sails hollow carapaces of crabs picked at and cleaned. When I swail, I cannot tell border from border, land from water. I feel the loam of day crumble, washed up what's left, an accumulation of silt or sand sifted rubbery tendrils of seaweed dotted with notches like taste buds inflamed. Sometimes I think love is swale and sometimes sadness. 
how each comes in like a tide, how each alters the bodies beneath. Heart, be complete. Come out of your grave light. It was decades before I was alive when the estuary was diked to make more land for pasture. The water no longer water them, but fields of sown grasses for the cows to eat. How they too must have tasted it. The memory of water buried in the new green shoots, the verdant nourishment still tasting faintly of brine. And um, I'll, I'll close with just a few poems from the sequence that concludes um, the book. Um, I, in one of the recent Hudson Valley readings, um, um, you all were talking brilliantly about the lyric and the lyric being ruptured, right? How can we write one lyric poem in this world right now? Um, and how many of us are, are looking towards sequences and shards and, and, and um, this is a sequence um, that looks to another extinct animal, the dodo bird. Um, it's called So Legged and Footed. And um, these are uh, the opening poems from that series. O oh, dodo, you can't do what others do. You're caught up in a wild bulb of a beak. There are sunsets tied to your dum dum feet. Your dreams are floral scented. Little wings token and tucked. Have they ever had such fears of flying? Why this world is strange, it tries me. Dodo, I miss you. No one has your charm. When I fell in love, the earth was an iron blue bruise. I can say this to you, who expects nothing, no new news. Yes, it's better here on the ground. I was angled, sun stunned and tossed when I thought I saw you, sea battered and streaming. Your island was near and those oceans. In my dreaming, you kept charging, then falling asleep, blue eyed and blunted. Dodo, Duado, sluggard, fat arse, not bum, fool. But if Dodo, Dodar, Dode is to falter, then I'm foul, feathered, grief spent, spurned. Who wouldn't think the world concave and bluish? The sky a wave up from the sea, drawn back again, thick salted air. You carried your plumage like I carry my sleeves, gray, ill-fitting at the seams. Still, they called you ostrich, rail, albatross, and hen. Cursed your tough breast meat, the wrinkle in your wings. Do you remember the time one chased you to their circle, sailor revelry and smell? and held you up by one stubby leg to dangle in the air. Island crier, gray coat, how you sang out as you were lifted, how all your kin dispersed came running to you. One more, Swampland, Bog, Mar en Songe. Sea of dreams, but the translation slips. I think a song to sing before the singing's done, a mouth rounded out like a coin. The history books all say the same thing. First, there was the swamp, then a man who went wild in it, found it was a shallow pool of bones 
purple birds submerged, black beaks and flightless wings. How he tried to gather them up like wheat in his arms, like a woman with sheets. Can I catalog what is not mine to count? Can an island slide off in my sleep? To dig more bones, that's what the men were hired for. They found them with their feet out into the swale of that swamp, stepping waist deep water like a seam. Then all the battered hollow limbs, the caved in skulls lifted toward the light. What lets me dream when the world keeps rolling out like a map at both ends, this side curling, that side warped. Dodo, I do not doubt the earth, but there is this continental slip. I keep losing the headlands in the crook of your beak. The coastlines get covered up in your feathery scruff. Those men whose names I cannot find, were there two, were there 10? Who's to say from what or when? Thank you so much, Allison. That was really beautiful. Thank you for sharing those poems with us. And don't forget, um, not during the reading, but after the reading, don't forget to buy Swale um, from the press. And we'll save the chat so you can read all of the compliments that have been coming in for you about your poems. Cave Canem alumnus, Tommy Blount, is the author of Fantasia for the Man in Blue from Four Way Books in 2020. A finalist for the 2020 National Book Award. And he's also the author of What Are We Not For from Bull City Press in 2016. A graduate from Warren Wilson College's MFA program for writers. He has been a recipient of a fellowship from Breadloaf Writers Conference. Born and raised in Detroit, Blount now lives in a nearby suburb of Novi, Michigan. His book was just named a finalist for the Lambda Literary Arts Award in Gay Poetry and just named a finalist for the Tom Gunn Award in gay, for Gay Poetry. A. Van Jordan says, of his astonishing long debut collection, Fantasia for the Man in Blue. With Fantasia for the Man in Blue, Tommy Blount captures the tension between what horrifies us as a nation and of what we crave to soothe the pain. An achievement of saying what needs to be heard at a time when there is so much chatter among us. He manages to cut through the din by directing us to the beauty that remains. Dear Tommy, thankfully, quote, you are the disobedient one, littering the spangled blue night with your dark tear, which is a comfort. These poems, a cocktail, not only of urban Gothic, but also of a sublime fantasia, will change how we listen to the world around us and teach us the uses of its enchantment. Please help me welcome Tommy Blount. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> um, We're so excited for you, Tommy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it all feels like it's happening to somebody else. It all, it, it, it does. So when you were reading the, you know, the bio and the introduction, it's like, that's somebody else. That's not me, no. Um, yeah, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Hudson Valley Writers Center, for having me here and allowing me to read with Allison and Brian. Um, it's an honor. Um, I will read, I'm going to read this poem that isn't new because I'm not writing. That's the story I'm, I'm telling. I'm not writing. 
Um, but it, it's a it's a it's a new to the air poem. Poor you, it isn't going to be easy to slake me. Retouched, a double tapped vision. This white man's countenance, then underneath it, another monument of whiteness. One makes room for another. One jawline rightward shifts. The gaze of the other eyes me as if it wants to put to rest, not a lesson in pillage. In admission, don't make me say it, to say there are waves of bodies shifting, a bed rocked by the primitive, loopholes in their biology, no holes in the white sails, more holes in the sheets, the held ghosts of so many forced entries and exits negotiating each other. A future made of nothing but churned whiteness. Is it not a chain? This historical feed of I want what I want. And do I not want to be more than witness, to be closer to this white chin under its cover, a white with which to lie. Can you hear me, blonde head? Lie against me in the bed you didn't make. Like your great great grandfather, touch my unmastered face. I promise not to know anything. Check my teeth, my nose. Don't I too have your nose? Oh, baby, you've got my nose opened in your eyes, deep blue of good boy, good boy. It's too late to leave. Come back to this bed. Get back under the soiled sheet. After all this time, am I not still thirsty for your hooded cock? Hmm. Actually, I have to read off of my screen because my printer is failing me. I love the 21st century. <clears throat> I'll say that too. Um, so let's see if I can do this. <clears throat> Here we are. Um, so this one is also new to the air, um, but it will be out in um, Gulf Coast, thanks to Vivi Francis, yay. Um, uh, it is a contrapuntal and um, I wrote it after um, one of these photographs in, in a series by um, Lyle Ashton Harris and um, his brother, Thomas Allen Harris. Um, and I think most of them feature those two, like uh, Lyle and, and Thomas Allen, it features both of them in the same photograph. But in this particular photograph, they're both naked um, and one is holding a gun to the other and at the same time, they're like in this passionate kiss. Um, and it's titled Brotherhood, Crossroads, and et cetera, number two, 1994. At his gun's insistence, my jaw goes slack. Call it a kiss? If this isn't love, then I will, willing to cross the distance, earn his favor. Afraid to let go, I lean into his body's bleak weapon. Why not trust this dark tunnel's burrow across the hate-wide distance between us? Yes, trust in my brother, God of this small destruction, for his aim is my aim, his arm my arm. We can steady the gun's bright kiss 
a pillow. It tickles me, but I'm too afraid to laugh and break this embrace. I do not like his body when it is seen for my body. And now, this accomplice, another death hard brother, illegitimate sibling silenced against me, muzzle to milk hollow tit. Oh, do I not long for my brother's hand in love of what came before this rage? Do I not love my brother enough to kill him before another brother can? I, wouldn't I, favor him if I were not ready to die by the hands of my brother's arms? No, I don't wanna see what comes next. It's my mouth, not my eyes. I open as if to sing, trust in my brother. God of this small destruction, for his aim is my aim, his arm, my arm. We can steady the note low as the number of fingers it takes to tickle a bullet free. Why be afraid? Let him go. Don't I believe in this dark tunnel burrowing across the distance between us? my tongue busy with his tongue. I'm a quiet hostage who's given up. The gun holds my finger in its small O of betrothal, wedded in love of what came before this bothered blood. At his gun's insistence, my jaw glows slack. Do I not love my brother enough to call it a kiss? If this isn't love, then I will kill him before another brother can, willing to cross the distance, earn his favor. Afraid I, wouldn't I, favor him if I were not ready to let go. I lean into his body's bleak weapon to die by the hands of my brother's arms. Why not trust this dark tunnel's burl across no, I don't want to see what comes next. The hate wide distance between us. Yes, it's my mouth, not my eyes. I open as if to sing, trust in my brother, God of this small destruction, for his aim is my aim, his arm, my arm. We can steady the gun's bright kiss of hello, the note low as the number of fingers it takes to tickle, it tickles. I'm too afraid to laugh a bullet free. Why be afraid and break this embrace? Let him go. Don't I believe I do not like his body when it is seen in this dark tunnel burrowing across the distance for my body and now this accomplice between us, my tongue busy with his tongue. I'm another death hard brother, illegitimate sibling, silence, a quiet hostage who's given up against me, muzzle to milk hollow tit. The gun holds my finger in its small O. Oh, do I not long for my brother's hand of betrothal, wedded in love of what came before this rage, this bothered blood. Um, okay. I guess I should read out of the book. Okay. Uh, so I had an order. I keep doing this, this at these readings. Like I'll have an order and then knowing I'm like an anxious person that like does not like things changing at the last minute. I end up changing things at the last minute. I don't know what it, I don't know what that's about. Um, yeah, okay. I will read um, Not an Elegy for Eric Rhodes. Um, and it, this poem, um, Eric Rhodes uh, was a gay porn star who was like really big in the, I want to say the early aughts. Um, yeah, the early aughts and into the, the teens. Um, and um, he wound up killing himself. Um, 
but he was also like a blogger and all this other stuff. But this poem is not about him, actually. It is about him and it's not about him. It's like, it's weird, whatever. Not an elegy for Eric Rhodes. You could have just as easily fit another body inside this poem that isn't a white man, shaved and muscular, whose storyline, it seems, is always to be the cop with the weakness for the perpetrator pinned to the ground in such a way that it sounds as if he cannot breathe, the throat locked under the glazed forearm. The perpetrator is black and so are you. Yet you insist on giving the shiny star another scene in which to shoot his wad one more time when the scene of the crime is full of wadded bodies whom you too could be mistaken for, shot then shot on video in another kind of blue movie. Tommy, don't you wonder if you've worshipped his white body enough by spilling yours. Not gonna read that one. Okay. Um. <laughs> oh. I'm a bit loopy too, I should say, sorry. <laughs> having a good time uh <laughs> it's so the I, stage of the pandemic tommy We're yes it is with you there. <laughs> it's march it's as my friend shaharazad would say it's march 365 or 367 or something like that i don't know i can't do math um i will read the, the title sequences of the book um so Fantasia for the Man in Blue um, is a sequence. Sometimes I refer to it as a single poem, but it's it's really they're really a, a sequence um, that serve as the spine for the book. Um, and so each time that um, this event that's happening in the poem gets revisited, it gets recast and and shifted and, and when it does that, the tone changes. And so that tone sort of affects the poems that follow it and, and poems around it. And, um, um, but I'll just read the, the, the four quartet of poems. Fantasia for the man in blue. You know good and well, you can't be out here in the dark morning to take in the moon. Full as that bowl of light attached to this police cruiser. Like a grayed elephant shoots air through its trunk before it charges off to safety from a mouse in one of those old black and white cartoons. You shriek in a debutante's pitch, even though there are reports you are as large as an elephant. Car thefts in the area. The man in blue explains after he asks, where do you think you're going? It's unusual to see your kind walking at this hour. You're an elephant who's really just a man sweating away in a mascot's costume. You mumble an address. You fumble for an address that isn't your address, but mine. Oh, you've done it now. Don't say anything else. Let me take over this body, soften what letters will bend. I am a poet after all. Don't worry, you'll see. He'll wish us a good morning and let us go after he bends us over the black hood. Fantasia for the man in blue. It's the great blue hero, elephant trunk 
hung, chewing the set and every man in it like the big star, a convincing replica in the distance video promises. He flashes before he slash flashes his long nightstick at hustlers and car thieves who know I want as much as you do now touching yourself, pretending the man in blue would bend over backwards to protect you from the boredom of your unremarkable penis. You get off on this, even when it isn't on screen in front of you, all in your head. Let's say you're a criminal. You fit the description. You did everything of which you are accused. Now, Say there is a deal on the table, then imagine that you are on the table. And like evidence, a bargain, if you let him, he swallows you, promises to forget the whole thing. Say you let him cuff you, every address ending in sir, the way your father taught you. Fantasia for the man in blue. You know that painting, right? Matisse's Icarus? No, not so much a body to speak of, a darker suggestion, an absence of a body, an outline surrounded in blue. That's you. What you were, I can see fitting the description if you were not denied a face, arms perhaps tattooed with a lover's name, a mother's face, some evidence of having a life and of your manhood, or is it? Either way, the blue has its way with you. It's constellation of small destructions all around you, shell casings. No, not so much the shell, just the evidence of the shell. A bright wound where a heart can't possibly exist. This will be my last one, by the way. Fantasia for the man in blue. What should you have expected? It's still dark at this hour. There's a star in the crest of his shield, too small to shield a thing like the heart. You're like that Matisse painting of Icarus, you almost say, before you realize it's all wrong. The color's all mixed up in your head. No. You are the disobedient one littering the spangled blue night with your dark tear. It's wrong to say this, you know, but the officer is so hot. You want to kiss him and run your fingers through his blonde hair. Sigh. Just look at the way the moon catches his metal. He shimmers a handsome pistol. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tommy. I'm so glad you read the, the title poem sequence. Oh, you have your Batman mug. <laughs> Thanks so much. Brian Comey Dempster's debut book of poetry, Topaz, was published by Four Way Books in 2013 and received the 2014 15 Bytes Book Award in Poetry. His new book, Seas, was published by Four Way in fall of 2020. He is also the editor of both From Our Side of the Fence, Growing Up in America's Concentration Camps, which received a 2007 Nissi Voices Award from the National Japanese American Historical Society and Making Home from War, Stories of Japanese American Exile and Resettlement. His poems have been published in New England Review, North American Review and Plowshares and in several anthologies as well. His work as a poet, workshop instructor, and editor 
has been recognized by many grants and foundations. He's also received scholarships to the Breadloaf Writers Conference. He's a professor of rhetoric and language and a faculty member in Asian Pacific American Studies at the University of San Francisco, where he received the Distinguished Teaching Award in 2010. Currently, he divides his time between teaching and serving as Director of Administration for the Master of Arts in Asia Pacific Studies. Of his book, Patrick Phillips says, Brian Comey Dempster's central subject, his son's epilepsy, could not be more freighted with risk and yet sees achieves a pitch perfect harmony of lament and praise, suffering and solace. At its heart is the child, Brendan, his head a sunflower too heavy on its stem and the father's searingly honest account of what it means to love him, a gold knot of shadow and light. This is a stunning heartbreaker of a book. Please help me welcome my press mate and friend, Brian Comey Dempster. Thank you, thank you. Gratitude to Allison and Tommy for the lovely readings. Huge, huge gratitude to Jennifer. And where's Sophia, Sophie, where is she? So I wanna give a shout out to her as well for all her amazing work. And really the Hudson Valley Writers Center is a venue I respect. And so Jennifer, we're so, so happy to be here. And what I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna read a series of poems that reflects the arc and trajectory of the book. So I'll read some from the opening section and then some from the middle and then a few from the closing. The first one I'm gonna read for Jennifer because she asked me to, and I do think it's appropriate in light of anti-Asian violence in the United States. It's called Seized, S-C-I-Z-E-D. And mainly what you need to know is that my son, Brendan, as Jennifer has mentioned, has epilepsy, and my mother, Ranko, was incarcerated in Topaz prison camp as a baby. And one day when I was writing, somehow those events converged in my imagination. By day, by night, in handcuffs, through mind scramble, brain surged, shock of force, body taut, alerted, taken, outside, inside, any time, any place, no words to explain, my infant mother, 1942, my young son, now, the rug, his twisted body, his world inside, and what it does, red flare or white lightning, fried impulse or smoldering heat, the searing of gray or glitter of stars veiled by fog. Her fragments, yellow orb, the porch light. Shimmer against her face, the cradle, her mother's arms, a blanket's false cover, itch of wool, hives on skin. Things just happen by bus, by train, in war, electric storms, a horse stable, desert, sand swirl and mind gust, thought sparks, word cloudings, mountains spike against white, a guard's boot, trodden syllable, a thorned cage, wing pierced, baby hawked in wire, my barbed string of words to capture him, capture her, if he never speaks, I carry him. If she cries for her father, grandmother carries her. Some place, my mother carries what is unremembered, begins to know when I ask. I don't speak of things I can't know, of despair about my son. 
We never know where we are going, where love will end us. Yeah, in light of the events of the last few weeks, that poem feels different to me now. I'm gonna read the final poem of the section. And I come from a family of musicians and artists. And my father's a trombonist, my mother's a painter, my brother's a cellist, and I'm a poet, which I think is a musician. I mean, I'm gonna say that. So I hope you all agree after Tommy's contrapuntal that that, that is definitely music. That, that, that was electric and alive. So this is called Storm Music and closes section one. Son, we tried to fix you. Halfway up, you cut out, starts, stops, notes bent, lost, music, warped, you skip inside us. Orange tip, struck your flame, stains us. We skip a breath and hold you. Grooved dark, unseen nicks, sky's black disc. We spin between static and song. Your flashes fill our hands starred. Brendan, a storm is not your face. We wait for lightning to be light. Because Jennifer read Patrick's blurb, I'd like to read the poem that includes the image of the sunflower. My son, Brendan, you know, writing this book, one of the challenges and rewards was how many things I could compare him to because he's indescribable. And as poets and writers, as many of us in the audience are, what is the language to describe what is beyond language, right? Because he's nonverbal. So this poem attempts to describe my beautiful, amazing son. It's called Stunted Crop. Our bed, a dark garden. His head, a sunflower too heavy on its stem. Husk we can't discard. He seeds our fallow field, blooms into night's uprooting. Our voices clipped like stems in water. He's worse. Yeah, I know he's worse. What else do you want me to do? Stock in the wind shaking us. Look up, Brendan. We're right beside you. Our questions sway with him. Which useless potion to give? Liquid pink or white capsule? Kepra, Topamax, Felbitol. When they open him, sprinkle his mind with light. Slice into the charred core. Will the earth let him grow? I feel you, Tommy. It, it, it's getting emotional after a year of this. And I'm just so happy and grateful to be here with you all today. Thank you for being here to commune with us in poetry. It's very moving to me. I am going to read another poem that overlays my son and mother. My mother Renko's in the audience and was the artist of the painting that you saw for the front cover of Seas. That's, that's my mother Renko's work. So this piece is, is about tunnel visions. It's about what happens when you go through a traumatic experience and you can't recall it. You, as an infant, went through it, so it's fragments. And what does that mean in light of my son's condition? Tunnel visions. Bent coins of words spill rusty from his mouth, 
incomprehensible. I don't quite remember, my mother says. Rain sheathing tires, I swerve across lanes. In the rear view, see his wounded face. I want to know more, I say. A bloody space between his teeth, the blank shape of every loss. My mother's past, his topaz eyes, her sand portal, barrack windows, shards and crystals, knives of lightning, flashes of carp. That's what I have, she says. Her memories are dark roads. His lips flicker, unspoken. We enter the tunnel, climb the stone throat to the eye of light. Okay, so kind of get a feel of the book. The book is moving through this journey of being a father to Brendan, who is amazing. And later in the book, in the third section, and in other parts, I try to imagine what his voice is and what I imagine him thinking. So it's in italics, my imagination of that. And this poem at the park is a short poem that steps into that for a moment. At the park. An invisible rope pulls back his head and a hand rips the blue sheet of sky. At the edge of his world, I make out his torn voice. Papa, my eyes open, the rest of me closed. So moving to the final section, my hope for this was to find some resolution and to find some sense of reconciliation. And that being said, as in Buddhism, reconciliation, suffering and happiness and joy are often juxtaposed and simultaneous. So I'm gonna read this poem. I was thinking of Allison's Dodo Bird poem. I love that poem. So I thought, God, I gotta read Bird Cries, you know? So uh, Bird Cries, I'm just gonna read it. I miss exits, veer through the world dangerous. Drive with earplugs, strain my neck to check if my little boy is all right. At home, I wear headphones to block out his squawks in my own birdcage. Shut up, I yell when he breaks through, squeeze his cheeks hard, hold him by the shoulders, be quiet, a flock of seizures. His fingers claw into my wrist. He says so little, I can't shut him out. His good arm flaps, shadows swoop down on him. I keep him from falling, keep him from flying. Some sounds are torture, my dad says. If my boy is quiet, his friends will like him. When he screams, neighbors could think I'm hitting him. I strain to hear the radio cry when I drive to work. A blackbird can be seen 13 ways. I fly to retreats to write about him. When I come back, he is still caged. I shampoo his hazel hair and he soothes me with coos. Hi, hi, nice voice, buddy, I tell him. He nests quiet in his wheelchair. Poor little guy, my mother reminds. So much to say and no words. His mind, a deep sky, she believes he will rise into. Well, 
I think I'm looking at the time. I think I'm going to finish with the final poem of the book. And I realized today, this is one of my last readings for spring and for a while. I have one more Friday, but I realized I haven't read this poem at any of the readings that I've done since September. And I realized it's because, as I think a lot of poets can feel, sometimes the poems that take the risk or step out into something are the hardest to read. But I feel with Jennifer here, my, my parents here, and you know, Tommy and Allison's brave work, I'm just going to read it. And it, it's called Tangle, and it ends the book. Did I poison his seed? He yellowed, a plant needing water. All they could do, shine lights to cure the jaundice. I am nodded, Grace's mother give him liquids. The doctor hold back so he'll latch on. And my mother's question, what did you eat and drink that night? My veins filled with sashimi's mercury, liquid gold Sapporo in the tatami room where Grace and I made love and Brendan began. Outside the Rio Con window, Ito's river twisted into the sea. My half Japanese and her full Chinese fusing into a strain impure and volatile. Chromosomes unwed as we unite. Our double helixes, a strong braid that unravels toxic. The needles sting, vaccines flow through his veins. Holistic megadose miracles. Subo pinpoints on his skin. Fragile X tests, fecal transplants. We are pulled too close, woven together, we might mend him. My mother, Jin Shinjitsu's him, warm hands on his cranium. My father crushes vitamins on his food. He'll be fine, Grace's father says. After hours with him, only one half-built tower. We search surgeons to take him apart bring him back better. Our Chinese doctor says each seizure shakes the tree within, frees him from the past. Spirited through by his ancestors. This tangle could mean I'm a good father, Grace, a good mother. I help him stack the tower higher, open his trust account. She steadies him on the tricycle's black seat. His rhythms and circle guide, dizzy, disorient us. We follow jagged lines, come to loose ends, pick up broken branches. Never just one way. The tangle, this could mean it's all his fault or all ours. This could mean we'll let go or we'll never have to. A gold knot of shadow and light, he binds us. Thank you, everyone. It's been an honor. Thank you so much, Brian. What a wonderful trio you guys were together. Thank you so much for this reading. And as we head into um, National Poetry Month, um, I know we're gonna be hearing a lot of readings, but this is gonna stay with us. Um, Sophia and I are going to ask the three of you some questions from the chat. Um, and we're gonna save the chat as well. Um, because we want you to be able to study get down. <laughs> we want you to be able to read it and hear all of the compliments from everyone. Um, here comes a question from Karen. 
Could each of you talk about form in your work for a little bit? I can I can say something. Um, Brian, oh my goodness. Allison, oh my goodness. Um, I'm a mess over here. Anyway, um, yeah, okay. Form, right. Um, well, I guess I'll talk about the contrapunto I wrote tonight. Um, so it's specific because for me, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a case by case basis with, with form for me. Like, um, I'm really good at failing at forms, which is why I think I'm attracted to them because I, I'm attracted to that failure of the form. Um, so like in my book, I have a, um, I have a, a, a sonic, it's, it's, a, it's called, um, um, hard-headed Obad, and it's a sonnet with like two envoys, and that came out of a failure. Um, but this contrapuntal I wrote, um, this was one of the instances where I knew that it was it it had to be a contrapuntal because I was trying to get the get at these two figures and these two voices. It was kind of easy. Uh, because I wanted to get at these two voices and um, and um, and also what I love about um, my contrapuntal, I don't often say this about my, you know, that I love my poems out in public. I don't know say that, but but what I love about this contrapuntal is it's um, there's like a, a kind of there's a kind of resolution that's not a resolution, um, which is always my aim when I'm writing poems is, is I'm um, uh, like when I'm getting to the end of a poem, I'm always after this sense of uneasiness because if I'm comfortable with the ending, like if I, like if I go, okay, that's, that's, you know, that's the poem. That's usually a bad thing because I don't trust myself with that kind of thing. But if I feel uneasy about it, it's usually a good thing. And I like that, that I always say, I like there to be some kind of chaos in the resolution in the end. So, so yeah, so with that, that contrapuntal um, and with other forms too, that's what I'm after. How can I make it my own and um, get it wrong, so to speak? Yeah. Um, should I? <laughs> I'm glad to jump in or Allison, whoever would like to, I, I'm fine either way. I, in my first book, Topaz, I had more traditional forms. And I think it was because of graduate school, to be frank, I took a prosody course. And so I had some sustenas in there, heroic couplets. And, you know, as you know, I, I think I can relate to what Tommy's saying. I mean, for me, there's, there's a way in which the constraint of it is challenging and fun until it no longer is, right? Because when it, when it stops working is when you stop using the form, right? And so I think it's a good way to generate material, right? That, that be, because you're forced to be imaginative in your sort of lexicon and, and your word choices. But I also think it's important that in the draft process, you're um, willing to let it go and not feel wedded to it if it's not working. Obviously, Tommy's form worked beautifully. In my recent book, there's less of those traditional forms, but there is a huzzle, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, as, as the first poem. And I, I would just say that the, I also consider form in free verse to be how it looks on the page. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of, it's yeah. maybe hard to see, but in C's, there's a lot of white space and shorter lines because I feel that the material is too much intensity to be compacted, both for the reader and the writer. And it also, my son's experience is fragmented as is the Japanese American historical incarceration experience. So that idea of kind of fragmentation of white space seems authentic to the content. So my word on form is that it really is about an, an intuition of the poem as you're revising and shaping it in a way it's intangible, it's hard to describe, but you can feel the rightness mm -hmm. of the long versus the short line or the white space versus the compactness 
So th those are my riffs on form. How about you, Allison? Yeah. No, I, I love that so much. And Brian, I could, um, I've seen your poems on the page, but in your reading, um, I could feel that blank space. Um, I could feel that sense of the shards um, and, and the poems sometimes feeling like the language is almost floating. Um, and it just, um, it's so beautiful to hear that um, and to kind of be remembering and imagining what it looks like on the page as well. Um, and I love, um, uh, Tommy, what, the chaos that you talked about, the uneasiness that you wanna feel at the ending. Um, form, um, for me, is um, I think all of those things. I have not tried to write in a received form before, at least not in, in a way that I have sent out into the world because um, I fail at it pretty miserably. Um, but I like the idea of constraint. Um, I like the idea of the sort of conscious mind dealing with a problem, right? Or dealing with a set of tasks that allows for some strangeness, some, some su surprise of the unconscious to come in. Um, but mostly I feel that that sense of what does this poem want to be? Um, is it, what's its relationship to that space of the page, that white space? Is it, is it one that's um, kind of just breaking into it little bit by little bit, right? Or does it feel more expansive? Um, and certainly um, this, this book took me a really long time to write because it's my first try at it. And um, the poems span a really long period of, of, of writing. And I did notice that earl my earlier poems tend to be shorter lined and it's almost like with time and I was able to kind of lengthen out a little bit, maybe grow some, some kind of, um, um, kind of belief in taking in that breath and letting it out. Um, so the, the lines got longer in, in, in the later poems and that was just something I noticed afterwards. Thank you all so much for those answers. Um, this is another question for everybody. Allison mentioned dealing with poetry in sequences and shards, and Tommy too deals with poems of sequences, uh, as in his quartet in Fantasia for the Man in Blue. And Brian as well has mentioned the fragmentation of poetry, particularly the fragmentation of memory. So at what point in your writing with and of fragments, Allison, Tommy, and Brian, did you realize you were working on something as whole as a book? Should I start? Allison, would you like to start? I, Zoom etiquette. No. <laughs> no, go ahead, Brian. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Sophia. So I think, honestly, when I started writing, I, I was not writing a book. It was uh, getting my son's diagnosis. There was a creative response to it, which had to do with processing. And the poems were quite emotional, quite intense, and quite uncensored emotionally. And so honestly, like they, they, they weren't that quote unquote literary, at least I wasn't thinking of that as I wrote them. And I was even okay with them being melodramatic or over the top, right? But what I realized was that the raw processing of the motion through the first draft was actually like, like if you think about emotional processing, the writing mirrored that. So as I revised the work or as I considered it, it made me think and be more clear emotionally with my son and who he was. So the revision process then actually was driven more by a healing process. But then I thought, well, maybe this would be helpful to other people, like maybe others with children that are atypical or even any parent might find this helpful because it's helpful for me. And then of course, I, I got into this idea of honoring my son 
and honoring the experience. And so then that's what drove it into the manuscript. But I hope that's answering the question. I mean, essentially the, the challenge of, of ordering the book was very immense because I had to decide, was this only a father son book or did I want to weave in historical and other violences towards Asian Americans and people of color? And ultimately I decided that it was more interesting and universal and would resonate and would be more authentic if I, I tried to layer it. Mm -hmm. And so the challenge of ordering the fragments of the work and the poems was to, was to have a central narrative thread and other things revolving around it that somehow spoke to it, but also had their own autonomy and distinctiveness. So that's my answer. What do you think, Allison? Yeah, well, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, um, I, I'm so drawn to um, sequences um, and series, um, I think in part because I, I um, am uncomfortable with the finality of closing something or saying like, well, that's all that one can say about that, right? Or exhausting. Um, um, and so I had a number of different sequences in the, um, in the book and I one sort of worry I kept having was, are they gonna talk to each other? Are they gonna, um, how can these exist in the same, in the same kind of arc? Um, and at some point I had to just kind of um, believe that what leads me to writing many poems, say for instance, the um, sequence on the dodo is the oldest in the book, right? Those are very old poems. Um, and yet to me, they're kind of the heart. Um, and so just knowing that whatever led me to be obsessed, right? With that dodo um, is, you know, part of me, like it or not, and that that's that's going to lead to and connect to other poems as well. Um, right? Yeah, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I loved that question. Um. Yeah, I, I have. So, I've answered this question like a thousand different ways, and I can't. I can't seem to nail it down. Um, but. Um, what this book, like you, Allison, this book has taken me years <laughs> to, to write. I didn't know I was writing towards a book, um, but I was always very, um, or at least first I was told this, I didn't notice it, but I was told this, I'm very faithful to my obsessions. Um, and so like in my own head, you know, I'm writing the same poem over and over again. Um, but also it has to do with, um, it's not, it, I don't see, when I'm writing in, in a sequence, I don't see it as fragments. Mm -hmm. um, I see it as um, looking at the same thing over and over and over again and recasting it and like turning it this way and turning it that way um, to see, you know, to complicate the situation to, um, to question it, to trouble it. Um, and so for me, um, the Fantasia poems were about that, mm -hmm. but they were also um, a kind of exercise. I hate that word, but it is. It was a kind of exercise um, in me trans in uh, transferring naked rage into something else on the page. Mm -hmm. um, um, I was pulled over, pulled over uh, by my local town police twice um, for uh, for taking walks because I was I, I walk in I walk early in the morning and it was on doctor's orders you know if you know if you don't know, get out there and move you're gonna get diabetes and die so ironically enough you know they too want to do something to me I don't know what anyway. Um, so, um, when that happened, I was, you know, I was full of rage, you know, full of anger, of course. Um, and so those first chunks of, um, like I was writing about and, you know, the man in blue was always there. I was writing these chunks, um, of just rage and, um, 
and then once I got once I got that out, um, once I got that rawness out, and started thinking about the poem, and started thinking about um, what to do with that rage and how to make that rage something else that is beyond me, that is larger than me, um, that um, a, a sort of self that's alien to me, that is, um, yeah. Uh, that's when I. That's when. That's when those poems started, you know, gelling and becoming something. Um, I was also reading Cornelius Eadie's. I always point to Cornelius Eadie's brutal imagination because, in that book, I think that he's also taking um, this naked rage and transforming it into something else. He's giving, you know, in those poems, um, as Susan Smith's imagined killer, he's giving Susan Smith what she wants. He's like. He's using his art. He's using, you know, the stuff that we know Cornelius Edie for. He's using all this brilliance to give Susan what she wants. He's building this, this, this figure for her so that so that so that we can see, um, so that we can see how absurd it is. How you know how you know. And so, and in that action, that was like to me, that was like the most. Uh, artful form of rage I've seen in, you know, uh, uh, poems. Um, um, and so that too, I was going for that too. Um, and so, like I said, you know, I'm, I'm very faithful with my obsession. So the, the trick to putting the book together was, was actually really listening to the poems. Um, because one of the, because one of the ways I'm, I'm, I think about the book, it, uh, when we talk about composition, like actually compositionally, like, you know, as a piece of music. So like the Fantasia poem sort of strikes a note, um, that, uh, or register that the other poems have to either harmonize with or create dissonance with. Um, so yeah, so yeah, I don't know. Um, that's not like a definitive answer, like, oh, I did this and did this. No, it was just, it just kind of like, it was a, a process of me like listening to it and, you know, eventually, yeah. That was really helpful, Tommy. I've, I've read some interviews with you where you have talked a lot about mentorship and how important um, that has been for you and, and being given reading lists. I recently heard John Murillo and Carolyn Forche talk about how important, you know, early reading lists are. Um, and even to this day, um, Carolyn says that she has three um, months, she spends three months with a, a poet and tries to read, uh, you know, all their poems, yeah. their, their letters, criticism about them. And Louise then Glick has been my companion this whole pandemic. Um, well, especially at the beginning, because I was reading her collected at the beginning of it. And, and yeah, she was keeping me company. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, a, good, a good volume. To yeah. <laughs> Not a bad choice to keep you company. Um, we have a lot of um, poets in the audience tonight, as, as you already mentioned, um, Sophia. Um, if you guys could just talk a little bit about um, putting together a first collection. Um, for Allison and Tommy, this is your, your first collection. Brian, you have to think back to Topaz. Um, but just some advice that, that you might give in the process um, to encourage and when it looks really murky and when it looks like there isn't an order, um, what, what might you say to, to these students who are working on this right now? Um, well, one of the things I, um, one of the, the, the little battles that I didn't, that I did not foresee um, happening within myself um, Martha was, was fantastic. We, you know, Martha and I, we, you know, we get along really well. Yeah. We're just, we just, we just chill. Um, so she gets me, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but really the, the difficult part for me was myself 
So one of the things that I, um, I struggled with, uh, you, know, you know, thinking back to Allison talking about um, how she moved from the short line to longer, how it grew. Um, one of the things I, sh I struggle with is taking up space, mm -hmm. um, like in, in my actual life. And, um, and, and even on the page, um, you know, before that. Um, and so one of the challenges for me was allowing myself to take up space with this book, um, allowing myself room to ramble, um, like really listening to myself and trusting myself. Um, I had readers, you know, here and there. I did, I have, I had, you know, I had, you know, friends read the manuscript. Um, they gave really good feedback. Um, some I took, um, but some I did not. Some I trusted myself because I, I, I knew that I had spent enough time with these poems and yeah, so that I guess that that's my advice is to, in the end, trust yourself. Um, you are the ultimate judge of your book. You are the ultimate one. Um, you will get feedback. Yes, takes you know take feedback where you you want to, but you it's your book in the end. So that's the advice I. Yeah, that's. Um... I love that, that sense of um, trusting yourself and, and um, in some ways um, quieting whatever kind of anxieties and, and nerves and worries that might be, you know, in the cloud around us. Um, um, and for me, at least it was trusting, um, trusting the time that it took you know, trusting the the long, long time, um, and the years that it took me to move from what I did as a graduate student, um, and realize that that was me testing out things, right, and slowly shedding those poems that were no longer something I believed in, um, were no longer mine, and were no longer part of part of this book and allowing that shedding to happen. Um, and sort of, it, it's a scary thing, but to go with whatever strange new thing seems to be um, uh, emerging, right? Um, that, that, and that it's, it's gonna take time for that to happen. At least for me, I, for, I think some people can write, you know, um, um, put a whole collection together in, in a number of months, right? And then work on it and revise it. Um, and that everyone's story is gonna be different, you know? And I, I worried that I was taking too long or, you know, this or that. Um, but once I started to feel, feel the collection come together, um, then, I trusted that um, and I knew it. Um, and it sounds, um, it sounds cliche to say that, but that you do kind of know, like in, in your stomach, you know, um, if, if, if you're being um, faithful to what you wanna be writing, right? Um, and that you're listening to that, that sense of, the poems that you want to write and not what you think you should be writing or what other people would like you to write. Um, and I think that that comes with time and, and it will come, it will come. <laughs> you just have to, to, to believe in that sense of, you know, what you know is right. I'm 100% with Tommy and Allison on everything they said. The, the idea of time you know both my books took over a decade and I'm not going to say how much more over a decade but I I really think that the MFA culture is a good one in that you get the two years or three years to write however I think one needs to be honest and say it is hard to write poems and it is hard to write poems that reach a certain standard and I completely agree with Tommy and Allison that you know, you know, when you've reached that standard, and you, you should not lie to yourself about that, you should be very, very clear. 
I also agree with them both that mentorship and community are extremely important to the process to avoid isolation and a sense of hopelessness. You know, I echo Tommy's gratitude as I'm sure Jennifer does to Martha Rhodes, who's just this amazing editor and she's tough and rigorous, but very supportive and warm. And that is an amazing combination to have. Also, as Tommy said, having readers that you trust, that get it, I think that's incredibly important. From a really practical or more literary standpoint, what I found extremely helpful was the idea of two major decisions in the case of my work. In both books, there was a, a central thread. In the first book, it was the Japanese American incarceration. In the second, it was the father-son narrative. And so the decision of both was, what was the quest of that book? What was the speaker's quest? And how could that order the poems and also make clear what should belong and what should not? The secondary question, and I'm sure all of us grapple with, is what else is going to revolve around the main anchor or central thread of the book? And that's where I think as Tommy and Allison have mentioned, that's where you have to trust yourself because some people are gonna say, no, keep it simple, keep it just this father-son book. And that, that might be a good book, but if you don't feel that's the book, you know, I knew that wasn't quite right. And so I think that's where you have to listen to the big voice, the spiritual voice that, you know, if the book needs to be bigger, if it needs to be more complicated, then it's, it, and that's why it takes time. And so I encourage all of you to find mentorship, find community, trust yourself, and figure out what is the quest of the book, sort of experientially, psychologically, you know, what is the trajectory of, of the speaker of the book? And, and then that's going to really help. So those are my final words. Jennifer, back to you. Thank you all so much for being here. This was such a great night. And um, Sophia will have this up on our YouTube channel probably tomorrow, knowing Sophia, because she's very speedy and amazing.